set up users, groups, permissions, and roles within your Amazon framework. Um, you can actually set up MFA devices if you want to have something. You can set up your password policies. You can set up your users, your groups, roles, and all the other things. One of the things you want to remember though is exactly this sign-in. If you want a URL for a sign-in page for your user account ID, you can also create an alias so you can make your own pretty page, but this is exactly where everything is going to go to. So if you want and have other administrators and you have people broken out by geolocation, this is where they need to go. So this is what you need to hand them or your own pretty page that you make up. So if you make users, right, what you can do is if you make a user, this is actually fairly straightforward, right? If you just want to create a new user, you can enter up to five at a time. Right? And then you can do what's called generate an access key for each one. They make sure that if you're going to do REST or query to AWS service APIs, right? So if you, then by what that means is that if you're going to have a user that's going to be running scripts back on the company computer and not necessarily within the Amazon framework, not going through the console, then you're going to want to make sure that they have their own access key for each user that you create. Right, and this allows them to use the automation and all of the scripting that you can do to automate a lot of the tasks and maintenance tasks, monitoring tasks, and other tasks. So, if you have people that are going to be doing system administration, this is definitely something that you want to do. You want to generate that access key for each user, right? And then, what it will tell you once you've done that is one user has been created successfully, you can show the security credentials and what you'll get is you'll get their access key ID and then their secret key. So just so you know I'm deleting this user afterwards. This secret access key and the access ID key are the two big important parts that you're going to need when they actually go through and take a look at building out their own processes. So you definitely want to keep this. This is important data for your user. You can also download the credentials if you want and it will save it as a spreadsheet. So what we're going to do is we're going to just save that file off and then not sweat it. And then we can just go ahead and close the window. Once you've got that, now because you've got your test user there are things that you can do with this test user. right? You can get put them into a group, you can assign them specific permissions, you can see their security credentials and manage their access keys. You can also manage their signing certificates, password, and then manage any multi-factor authentication device they have. And you can get a nice summary of where they're at. So if we want to add him to a group, we have two various groups. So we're going to add him to the users group. All right? And then you'll see that they're added up into that group and whatever permissions that group has is part of it we can attach a specific user policy and this is why I say that I am is a blunt tool not a finely grained tool right you can basically give them select policy templates you can create a specific policy for them or you can create a custom policy to set your own set of permissions if we select a policy template we're basically giving them whatever that template says Right. We can give them read-only, full access to a number of different Amazon components, or we can give them everything, all the way across the board. Right. If we do a policy generator and we select that, what we can do is allow specific processes within that so that they can actually do things. Right. Select whatever actions they've got, the specific actions that they can do, list, update, validate, um, do resourcing, delete stack, create things, and then the Amazon resource name that you're going to add to that. Or if you do a custom policy editor, it's essentially the same thing, but they want you to know how to do the code, right? So this is a very specific code set that you can do with your specific user if you want to do a little bit more fine-grained on this. You can actually set this up so that the person can just do specific things and not do other things. And this is what that actually looks like. So you see the statement, right, and brackets effect, allow everything. Allow action, they can do anything they want to do to all resources in this, right? So if we go ahead and apply the policy, 
we'll see what they're actually allowed to do. All right? And then the, the group policy. The group that they belong to has power user access where that specific person has administration access. The individual user policy will take precedent over the group policy. They'll work in whatever processes that they have together. Right? And then security credentials, if I need to manage their access keys, I can create another access key for them. Um, I can inactivate something if I think it's been taken. I can delete it. So there's tons of things that I can do with this. Um, if they want to make a signing certificate, right, we can actually make them an X509 certificate so they can secure access certain AWS process interfaces, you know, EC2 for access to SOAP and command line interfaces. They will want this if they're going to be doing things programmatically. Password, we can either create, auto-generate, or assign a custom password to this user. So. And if it doesn't conform, you can actually go ahead and it will tell you. So then you would have to go back and do that. If they have a multi-factor multi device, you can create a hardware or a virtual MFA device for them so that they can turn around and then do all the things that they need to do with your multi-factor authentication devices. If you want to give a user a specific role, right? if the role name is full auto, administration access show, we can change that policy, remove it. We can set trust relationships between the trusted entities that can assume this role and conditions. So if we do what the policy statement says, right? this one's a little old, allow principal service straight to Amazon EC2 and then assume whatever role that they need to do to make EC2 work. Right? So we can change our trust relationships between users and services. Right? And then as a summary, you can kind of go through and see how it check it out and that it's a AWS, I am this person number, role, full auto, and then they have an instance profile to go along with that. And then you can also set your password policy, minimum password length of the eight on upper, lower, however you want to set your password policy up. Inside your group actions, yeah, it's usual, add users, delete, edit group name, remove users from group. With users, it's the same kind of process. You can add user, delete user, manage their keys, their password, certificates, MFA, or remove users from groups. And then standard roles, you can go ahead and do all the things that you want to do with roles that you would do normally, either add or delete, and then how those roles work. So you could actually create a new role that's for the security team and then allows EC2 instances to call Amazon Web Services on your behalf, or we can do cross-account, right? Provide access to third-party AWS account, provide access between AWS accounts that you own. So there's all sorts of things that you can do with this. If you want to do an AWS account ID, you have to have that number handy. If you want to do other things, you know, third party access, they need their account ID and their external ID so they know, so that you know how you're doing this. Third party is actually really, really interesting, especially if you decide that you want to have contractors on board. This would be one way of setting up contractors or outside company entities to actually have limited access or other kinds of accesses to your system by setting up a role. So if we did, we did contractor. and then we went ahead and we set them up, select, and then we entered their account ID and external ID, then there would be my whole account set up for all my contractors as a role, and then we can add those users to that specific group, and we're in pretty good shape in terms of how that works. So this is basically IAM. This is how it works. This is what you can do with it. This is how it will actually work. If you want to go ahead and delete that user that I just created, right, and go through, user actions, delete user, are you sure, yes, and then you're done, and you really can't, then from there you're pretty much so good to go. Again, fairly straightforward, it works a lot just like any other kind of user management tool you're going to use. The thing that makes this all the more interesting is that it is, you really have a hard time getting this to be fine-grained. You can't set file permissions in this, you, you really are setting up how they interact with 
Amazon Web Services rather than the data that you put out there. You're still going to want that fine-grained tool whether you're using LDAP or Active Directory or some other control tool for all this. And that's essentially what IAM is all about. That's how it works and that is what you can work with. Again, just remember that if you make accounts for people, give them some place to go sign in and then you are pretty much so good to go once you've got them set up.